your internet presence is a vital part of your marketing approach. And many people interact with your business initially through internet searches. Now, they may not buy from you because of your website, but they'll definitely get to know you through your website. And so that's why it's important for you to be able to understand how to maximize the visibility of your website to the right types of people and also manage your reputation online. And those two aspects of internet marketing are the topics of discussion today with my guest, Michael Bazinski, a returning guest to Construction Genius. He is the president of Buzzworthy Integrated Marketing, and he is an expert at all things internet marketing related. So enjoy my conversation here today and think of it this way. If you ever go through litigation and that litigation becomes public on one of the projects that you work on and you want to be able to manage your reputation through that litigation, this episode will tell you exactly how to do that. Thank you for listening and enjoy my conversation with Michael. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Buzz, welcome back to Construction Genius. Thanks for having me back. I always have experts back on the podcast if I can, because I think tapping expertise in particular domain areas can be very helpful for my audience. So I appreciate you coming back on. Well, that awesome. I love sharing. So, so today we're going to talk about a topic that may not be at the top of mind for a lot of contractors, and that is SEO or search engine optimization. But it has everything to do with people being able to find your company on the internet and not just people in general, but the right types of people. So let me just kick it off and hand it over to you. Please explain to our audience, what is SEO? So SEO specifically is, like you said, search engine optimization. And what we're doing here is optimizing your website so that Google's algorithms will consider putting your website at the top of their search engine results page when searching for keywords most relevant to the services you provide. That's the short what, answer. What do you mean by keywords? So people utilize this, utilize search engines to either answer questions, solve problems, or find products. It's pretty much the top three things. And so for service-based businesses and like contractors, construction, and all that stuff, they're looking for either answers on how something gets done or who can do it for them, right? And so they're going to use certain key words to find answers to those. And so, so SEO identifies the most commonly used words and phrases, because there's actually keyword phrases as well, that are used specifically by uh, users over and over and over again. And so we can actually pinpoint these highly utilized phrases for very specific intents which lead to why are they looking this up, right? And so there's four types of intent when we talk about search. One is for information. So they're just looking for information. I just want to answer to a question, right? Another okay. one is navigational. When they're looking to get somewhere, looking for somebody in a certain uh, location, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's commercial. When they're deciding what, who to do business with, or what options we have for doing business or buying. And then we have transactional. People are ready to buy and they're just trying to figure out who they're going to buy it from. And so the keywords, we can actually um, identify the intent for different types of keywords. And that's why it's really important to have SEO really focus on those commercial and transactional keywords that are specific to the services you provide. So how do I know what those keywords are? I mean, because when we start talking about SEO mm -hmm. or search engine optimization, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it becomes this sort of, I don't know, fuzzy ball, yeah, whatever I mean, you want to call it. Yeah. How do I know what those keywords are? So you have to do keyword research and there's two ways you can do that. There, um, there is a, a free uh, website called askthepeople.com. Okay. 
And that one right there, if you just type in the topic of what you are talking about, so maybe just your service, right? Commercial contractor for dot, 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 right? And then yep. they'll, that, that right there, Neil Patel owns that one. And he's a renowned search engine marketing guy. He, he, you know, he has a lot of free stuff. He's got some stuff you can buy, all that good stuff. The you second, said askthepeople.com? I think it's called askthepeople.com. I don't think that's right. I just typed that in and it, it, it says it's for sale. <laughs> okay, so wait, hold on a second here. I will, I will find it real quick. So the other side of that, while I'm looking this up, is to have somebody, a professional, actually do the research for you, um, and they will, they will be able to ask the public. Sorry, my bad. Ask, ask the, the public. public. Yeah, got it. There okay. we go. Askthepublic.com. So, so that's why you can do it yourself, and you can identify those, and then you can take that and plug it into Google. AdWord uh, research tool, which will tell you how many people uh, or how many times those terms are being uh, looked up. Huh. And so you're looking for those ones that have been looked, that are uh, searched for on a regular basis. Now, for individual companies, we don't want really broad terms. So if you're a commercial contractor, say in Miami, right? You don't want just commercial contractor. You don't you don't need to rank for that. You want commercial contractor in Miami that specializes in dot dot dot. So it could be um, X type contractor in Miami and use that as your starting point and find out what related keywords are being searched there and then find uh, a few and we usually start between 10 and 25 keywords. We start you know start with a small pool because you want to stay focused and then really focus on those. Now what you're looking for is how to hire one, um, who are the best ones, those types of things. And so when you're working with a professional, they you can mean how to hire a, um, a, a contractor, who are the yeah. best contractors, those kinds yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So you, so you want to find those, you don't need them to have thousands of searches, right? Uh, just a couple hundred are fine. Even a hundred is great because if you have an average conversion rate and a conversion rate is just how many people how many people reach out to you versus how many people came to the website? So out of 100, if you have a 2% conversion rate, that means two people called you for more information. Right. So for every 100 people, if you have about 2% conversion rate, you're doing okay. Mm -hmm. And so that means you're getting two phone calls. So if you have 10,000, that's a lot of phone calls, right? That's 200 phone calls. You don't want you don't want 200 phone calls coming in because they're probably not going to be good leads. And two, you can't handle that many, especially in commercial contracting. I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, if you get somebody that is interested in there, there's a lot of work that goes between starting the proposal process and getting the the, the deal, right? Right. So, right. you know, you want high quality traffic. So you want to be very specific on the keywords they're utilizing and finding certain vernacular that your perfect clientele utilize to find you are what other people like them will use to find you as well. So then, so then my job is probably to outsource all of this because I don't want to spend my time as a CEO of a construction company thinking about this. So either I need to in insource it, so to speak, to a marketing expert that I already hired or take someone from the outside and have them do it. Is that right? A hundred percent. And we find that, you know, we, we work with a lot of in-house marketing firms that are very, um, they're very capable people, but SEO is its own little beast. There's a, a, a layer of technical know-how and then another layer of creative know-how and then it's also a lot of numbers. And so, um, you know, my SEO, like, cause our, our firm offers it and, you know, that that's a different breed than my other employees, <laughs> you know, that whole team, they talk a little bit different. Um, right. but those that geek out on SEO are, and, and they're actually passionate about it. That's, that's the people you want. You don't want a dabbler. You don't want somebody who says, oh yeah, I read a book about it. Or yeah, I, I, I think I did a little bit of that um, for my last company I worked for. You, you want somebody who actually knows what they're doing because you can go down a lot of rabbit holes and waste a lot of time, energy, and money on the wrong keywords. And then that means that the wrong people are coming to your website and that means that the wrong people are contacting you, wasting your resources. And that's the worst thing to do is get the the wrong keyword, uh, the wrong phone calls at the end of that process because it's a long process. Okay, so SEO is is key in terms of being found when people are looking for my construction services. One of the things that has has just come into public consciousness, I'd say, in the last four to six months is is AI. Mm. And so, how does AI 
affect SEO optimization for commercial construction companies specifically? So AI is, you know, it's, it's an artificial intelligence, right? It's right. not human. And there's a lot of people out there going, oh, well, you know, when we talk about SEO, we, we usually have to take into account that, that you have to have content for the search engines to chew on uh, in order to understand whether or not you are the person the, the, that the, the searcher is wanting to talk to, right? Right. And so a lot of what we do is help our clients with authority building. And that means there's content. And the easiest one is blogging because it's all text and it's something that the search engines can chew on and it's easily consumable by the user, right? right. Now, video is part of that, right? But right now, Google can't listen to audio to tell you what it is. So unless you have your transcript of your video, it doesn't know how. Now, there is optimization for videos on YouTube, and that's it's a different beast altogether there, right. but the same concepts matter, right? And so when we talk about blogging, there's a lot of people who say, oh, we'll just have AI write our blogs for us. Right. Well, if you've ever, even if you're good with prompts, yep. if you've ever listened or ever read what a AI like ChatGPT will spit out for you, you're probably not going to want to have anybody read that and then have your name at the end. Like, right. It's not that good. But what we see is utilizing um, chat GPT and other AI tools to accelerate the human process of writing and creating content. So I'll give you an example. The, I, when I write blogs for my own business, the worst part of writing a blog is the first word on the page. Mm. Blank, blank page syndrome bites me every single time. Mm -hmm. Period of story. doesn't matter. I don't know. I've been writing for decades, right? Um, just getting started. So I've found going to JetGPT going, I'm writing about, you know, and I tell them, I tell the computer who I am, right? Yeah. I'm Michael Bazinski and this is who, and dot, 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 because they can go search my expertise that's already there. Now that's for me, but yeah. either yeah. way you can say, Hey, pretend you are a dot, dot, dot. Right. And then they'll be able to create that context. I'm writing a blog about dot, dot, dot. I need an outline to highlight these main points. Dot, right. dot, dot. And then it spits out this outline. We copy that outline, put it on that blank page. Now we don't have blank pages anymore. We just have to fill in each of those. Another way that I've found just in, just in writing blogs is sometimes I need to get technical. I hate writing technical pieces right? because you have to do so much fact checking. Now, ChatGPT doesn't always get it right. So don't like, you know, you do definitely need to fact check their facts. But if you have something that's technical that you need to write about, have them write that paragraph and then you go through and edit it. That's a lot faster. If you can get it 80% of the way there, that 20% human interaction is all that you need to make it yours and very consumable by other human beings. Yeah. So th let me just summarize that because I think you, you bring up some important points. Typically, the stuff that chat GPT um, spits out is pretty soulless. but using it as a starting point um, is very good. Getting that outline and then adding in your expertise, correcting chat GPT when it's not doing what you want it to do, or you know it's incorrect, or you fact check it and find out it's incorrect. And mm -hmm. then as you do that, you can use it as a real tool, not as a complete substitute for yourself, but as an aid and a tool. Is that what I'm hearing? 100%. I call it an accelerator. AI optimized is one of my friends uh, calls it. Yeah, and and because you have to keep that human element in it, otherwise you are only regurgitating what everybody else is regurgitating. That's using AI because what is AI doing? But taking what's already out there from 2021 and before. Yeah. Right. So pretty soon Google will have its own AI called Bard that'll yep. actually be live and not telling people that. Well, Chat GPT their... just got an upgrade where the, where that you can uh, you can um, search on the web as well and within Chat GPT. Right. Okay. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that was like brand new. So yeah, that's right. So, and then Google will have it, but Google's, they're plugging theirs into like Google Sheets and stuff like that. Now you can use chat GPT in Google as well. So you yep. can, there's, there's extensions for that as well. So whoever's engine you want to use is mm -hmm. fine, right? Because there's going to be that competition. Whose robot is the smartest robot? Yeah. Right. And, and you, and we, we just have to remember that 
these robots are children's brains that have been programmed to learn things that it's told. Right. Okay? So the early on the the early AI we were looking at is basically just regurgitating what it can find in a database. Yes. Now we can teach it skills. So like one of the platforms that we offer our clients is a a, um, a, a client um, relations management CRM. Yep. And what we're doing with it is we're plugging in an AI that allows our users just to talk to the platform to say, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z. And then it goes in there. We also have a chat that go that we've taught the platform to that then can talk to somebody else who's trying to program things in the CRM and it walks them through it in regular speak. So all they have to do is chat with it and there is like having a, a human being, but they can think a lot faster and they don't have to re reference anything that they might not be as familiar with right. automatically. You can also have these chat bots start conversations, you know, so, Hey, uh, do you do X, Y, Z? Yeah. You can answer all these frequently asked questions and anything beyond that. Oh, you need to get on the, on the horn with an actual human being. Let me set that up for you. So right. all of these mundane actions that are happening online are getting replaced by AI. And it will like, like most everything, I'd probably say 80% of the things that a lot of people have offshored for the last 10 years yeah. are going to start getting replaced by AI. Yeah. Okay. Now, with that said, be very careful what you're replacing a, a humans with AI for, because you want to make sure your customer service is a human because computers can emulate human emotion, but they don't understand it. Right. And they're not going to, and they can make it seem like they are being empathetic, but really they don't, un, all they understand is input and output. It's still yeah. a computer. That's interesting. Okay. So then I can use chat GPT in a, a variety of different ways in my business. One of them being to help me as I've optimized my SEO to create articles that are um, blog posts and, and other content that is optimized for the, for the keywords. And so that I can be seen as far as search is concerned. How then can I go about identifying what would be my most profitable clients or, or, or leads that I really need to target through my search engine optimization? So I look at, I call it the, the perfectly profitable prospect, right? Okay. PPP. When we're talking about a company that is established, we don't go online. We go to our already profitable clients and we make profiles of them and we interview them directly. Why did you pick us? What did you like about doing business with us? What didn't, what, what could we have done better? I mean, you can do a lot of different things all at the same time as far as doing that market research. Cause that's all it is. Market research is just going out there and asking questions. Okay. Right. And who better than your most profitable, currently most profitable clients or your past cl most profitable clients. Okay. Now all of that's good, but then you also want to take a start asking questions like, where do you hang out? Where do you, where do you consume content? Uh, what social media platforms do you hang out on? What kind of television do you watch? What kind of radio do you listen to? You see where I'm asking all of those questions is because when we're going to look for traffic, we're going to, we're going to utilize the, the commonalities between those interviews and go, ah, here's a correlation. All of our perfect clients do X. All of our perfect clients like to read this. They listen to these podcasts. They read these publications. They watch these TV shows. They listen to this radio. You're creating that perfectly profitable uh, prospects profile. Okay. So hold on a second. And if I'm a commercial contractor, what, what do I care about? What what podcasts they listen to, or you know, sort of that personal aspect of it? Isn't it just, isn't it just all business, business, business? I don't think so. Tell me. I yeah, think please. that human beings buy from other human beings, uh -huh. and we're not always thinking about business. But when we're building authority, we are building authority. Much like we are doing right now, we're talking about what we're, we were passionate about. But when we are in business, sometimes we're just listening to other people's stories, and we'll we'll trip over an expert, right? And go, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about X Y Z, hmm. right? And they don't they don't know what they don't know, and then all of a sudden you're there. But when you're advertising and and those types of things and pushing uh, traffic to your website, let's go this way. Local hospitals, right? Yep. You think hospitals really need to advertise? Um, no. Okay. 
but they do. Why? Because they're humanizing their existence in the community. Right. Commercial contractors can get really big. And yes, we get to see their names on the, the side of building, um, the skeletons of buildings as they're going up or on the cyclone fence around the perimeter of a new contract, or a new construction site, right? That's yep. great. We know that you do that. Hooray. But what are you doing for the community? Because it's the humanality that your future prospects are going to remember, not always just the sign. The sign says you mean business, but when you find ways to connect with people when they're not even thinking about construction, that humanizes your brand and you as a, as a community member and people do business with people. Hey, this is Eric. Hope you're enjoying my conversation with Michael. Don't forget to check out my book, Construction Genius. Effective, hands-on, practical, simple, no BS. Leadership, strategy, sales, and marketing advice for construction companies. This is a great book. I know you're going to enjoy it. I know you're going to benefit from it. The best news is it's only 20 bucks. It's on Amazon. So scamper out to Amazon, search it up, buy a copy for you and every single leader in your organization, read it together, use and apply the information, and you and your people will become better leaders. Now, back to my conversation with Michael. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more about humanizing your brand because I know many people who are listening to this podcast they're like you know SEO that's kind of cool and all that kind of stuff in terms mm -hmm. of lead generation but you know I mean I just have people calling me you know I, I don't I don't I don't lack leads you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. but but there's this idea of humanizing the brand why is that important do you think for a commercial contractor well contractors in general and general contractors and are probably have it the worst, um, don't have a really good reputation. Okay. Right. They just don't. I mean, the industry doesn't as a marketer, I run into the same thing. There's a lot of bad marketers out there, right? You know, they're just they're They don't play nice. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They leave jobs half done all of that stuff. It's, it's just as bad in marketing as is in construction. Okay. Yep. So when you're able to make your differentiation is that you are part of a, the community what are the chances you're going to leave a job half done? What are the chances you're going to short somebody on a deal? You're part of the community. You're creating trust because you're approachable, right? I right. can find you. I, I can relate to you as a person. If you have two RFPs sitting there and all you see is black and white, white paper, black ink, right? Numbers at the bottom. And the numbers are really close, especially when you're talking tens of millions of dollars, right? Who's who you're going to go after? We know that construction is about who you know yep. and not how good you are a, a, a lot of times. Like mm -hmm. when it really comes down to it, who do you know, mm -hmm. right? And there's I, I have clients who are like, I don't do half the RFPs because I know who's going to get that job already. I already right. know who they know. Yep. And it's that, that person, I can't get over the relationship they have. I'm, I still have to work that network to be able to get that net worth, right? And so that's where that humanization of your brand comes, where it's not just business, you're a community member. And the more community you know, the more people are going to approach you. How do you, how do you recommend a contractor goes about identifying the community members who are not necessarily directly related to construction, but would be the ones that you want to build relationships with so that when people are thinking about those companies, mm -hmm. they associate you with them in the same bucket of thought. Mm, it's a great question. And this is, it's kind of a, a roundabout answer. It's not about the community members that are going to connect you to construction again. Mm -hmm. It's going to be about the community members who you can work towards something bigger than yourself, right? So I'm going to go back to the hospitals. I was yeah. just talking to a friend of mine who is a business development in, at uh, HSHS, uh, St. John's Hospital here in Springfield, Illinois, where I live. Mm -hmm. And the, the big wigs said, well, they're not going to sponsor this certain community event this year. And he was like, wait a second. That's like my big place to be in the community, right? right? That top of mind awareness where it's like, Hey, John and HSHS and this nonprofit or this community, uh, uh, this event giving back to the community or whatever that is. Right. 
that juxtaposition is the humanizing element, right? Even if it's just by name, HSHS as a, as a hospital is getting humanized, but the humans who work for them are also getting that same benefit by yeah. being at the event and they had their HSHS hospital uh, uh, embroidery on their shirt, sure. right? Or they had the hat or their name tag, whatever that is, right? Yeah. And that that transcends all industries especially construction because construction impacts the community. Every yep. project you do has an impact on your community and how you handle that is also a part of the humanization. If you don't take care of the neighboring uh, or the neighbors of your construction sites, you know, you're going to make a bad reputation. Uh, Donald Trump's a good example of that. A right. lot of people got burned by that guy. And there's a lot of people who have nothing good to say about him because of it, sure. regardless of whatever he's, else he's done in his life. When it comes to those real estate deals and, and how he handled contractors and construction sites and stuff like that, yeah. right? Reputation's everything. Right. Right. And so when we're, we're trying to human, when we're trying to pick out who in the community that we should be getting ourselves connected with, I say, follow your heart and follow what you find most important in your community? What do you, what can you get passionate about? Because the authenticity of whatever that is, is the most humanizing factor that you can get. And you can't synthesize that. Okay. So, so that takes a, a great deal of thought um, in terms of that humanizing part of marketing. And, and some people might be reluctant to even allocate time and, and budget towards that. Mm -hmm. what, what's your recommendation for first steps in terms of that broader marketing approach that a larger company should be taking on? Really, it's about the, if you don't want to do the homework yourself, bring in a consultant that can shortcut the process. Somebody right. who's done it over and over and over again, um, and has a methodology that can, you can walk through in a short amount of time. And then they can take some of that and do a little bit of research in the background and then come back and, and help you with a strategy moving forward that meets your criteria of bandwidth, budget, all those things. How, how can I, how should I be thinking about, you know, an ROI here? Because I, I understand if I spend, mm -hmm. you know, 10 grand on pay-per-click advertising, you know, I, I can, you know, hope to see some sort of ROI there. Whereas if I'm doing this general marketing, which we know a lot of larger corporations do, you know, how do I justify that to myself in terms of an ROI? So there, is, there are a couple of ways of approaching it. Okay. If you worked with a public relations company, their whole gig is about how many impressions you get. Right. Okay. When we talk about SEO, it's about how many uh, visits you get. Right. Right. There's always going to be some level of measurement that you can put forth or put against your efforts. Okay. Now, when we talk about branding though, it's a fuzzy math because right. branding gets interlaced with everything you do. Right. So the homework you do with your branding strategy up front permeates through all of those tactics. And so unfortunately there's no way to say, well, that brand that, you know, that branding brought that project. No, the brand it's your ecosystem of marketing working together that create the end uh, output of sales or whatever you're measuring. So that ecosystem of marketing. And again, it, you know, it, it, it is something where there's a degree of, of vagueness to it. So there isn't like, if you spend a dollar here on mm -hmm. this, you will get mm -hmm. $2 in return in this amount of time. Right. Let me ask you this. Um, I, I think this is something that sometimes we, we kick around about is how can I protect my brand in the marketplace when I've associated myself in directly or indirectly with other brands that may be tainted? That's a really good question. But before I answer it, can I go back to the last? Yeah, please uh, do. The last thing you said, when we talk about your integrated marketing ecosystem, yes, we have to think about the long game. Okay? Right. It's not what you're doing this year in mm. branding mm -hmm. will take up to a year to actually have as effectiveness and then exponentially can create return on an investment over the next few years after that until you decide to do a rebrand. Right. Okay? So we can't 
think about branding at, at like an in a in b out. It is part of an eco. Now, the tactics within we talked about being able to measure different uh, outputs or return on investment in different tactics. That's okay. Just make sure that you put it in a full. You look at it in the full spectrum of your marketing and not just always, oh, this one tactic didn't have quite the 1.4, 4.2%, you know, whatever it is you're looking for, for your ROI. You got to look at that in the the, the longer scheme of things and, and then also take a look at what is the length of time it takes for certain things to, to really permeate through your marketing. So back to juxtaposed with a tainted brand, the best thing to do is bury the relationship. And we do this in SEO as well, because sometimes you in reputation management is part of search engine optimization, right? So when you get a bad review and reputation management, the only thing you can do is bury it with other uh, reviews, five stars. So if you get a one star review, the only thing you can do is bury it with a bunch of five star reviews. So that's it. Hold right? on. I, I, this is actually an, another question came to mind. So we, we, I know tons of contractors who are terrific contractors who get into litigation and mm-hmm. that's just part of the gig sometimes. And then that mm-hmm. litigation hits the newspapers mm-hmm. and they're immediately as, as, as soon as you, you read a newspaper and you see that someone's in litigation, you, you, you assume they've done something wrong. Right. So when it comes to that sort of dynamic, mm-hmm. what should a construction company be doing when they have been unable to avoid litigation, but they still want to be able to protect their brand, particularly when the full story has not been told? And you hit the nail on the head. Start telling your side of the story. So many businesses, and I did it. Um, I had an unfortunate financial uh, issue come up. You know, it was an internal financial issue. Like it wasn't public, but it affected our outward um, capabilities, right? Yeah. And I, I got under this like, oh, everybody knows, but nobody knows, right? right. right. And not as many people know about the litigation as you think either, but. Right. Or the people who are paying attention, which are going to be the people who could do business with you or maybe stop doing business with you, yeah. you need to start telling your story immediately. Now, when I say that, you can't be the finger pointer to take zero notes from politicians. Right. Try, getting ahead of it is touch telling your story and telling it candidly. Right. Do not put your emotions into it. You don't, you don't point fingers at anybody. You don't call anybody a liar. You just say, unfortunately, we're going through this litigation. Uh, we were in this project here. And you talk about the things that your lawyer will allow you to talk about publicly. Right. Okay? right. And you got to listen to your lawyer because yeah. you've got more money and you're probably in the litigation on the line immediately than you do on your reputation. Right. So you want to you want to be released from that. So, yeah, what's interesting then is that. So let's say I am in some litigation and it gets resolved one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But all of that information is still out there on the Web. Mm-hmm. And that's when I'm assuming after the litigation has been resolved and I'm freer to speak, I may need to go into a more proactive burying, so to speak, approach. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So this is really cool because the the amount of competition for the keywords around that litigation are very low. Right. So we can actually create an SEO campaign that mm-hmm. targets the keywords that that the the news articles and everything are ranking for that bring up that court case, right? So now we create a short campaign to where we bury the anti uh, press down, right? Because even though you're going up against the press, the local press is not as powerful as your national press. So if right. you get national, yeah, <laughs> you just have to get a good PR firm and do what you do. What yeah. let them do what they do, right? Yeah. But if you're just, you know local litigation and it's it's kind of a pissing contest, then turn around and just make it a non-pissing contest and bury it. And you bury it by saying, oh, um, you know, so you tell the facts, you know, and you just be candid about it. But the thing is this, only 2% of the people are going to get to the second page. So if you can get anything that's working against you past the first page, you have a 98% chance of nobody ever seeing anything negative when it comes to that case specifically. That's interesting. So we've talked about what SEO is and how I can use AI to optimize my SEO. We've also talked about using SEO as part of my marketing strategy to humanize my brand. And then 
I think it's really interesting. SEO can also be used to help me with any kind of crisis management around issues of litigation. It's all perception. The whole, the whole point of SEO is exposure. Yeah. You want to be at the top of the page. Controlling the message at the top of the page. And you're controlling the message top page, positive or negative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you were, you ask the question, like what happens when you are um, associated with a bad brand? Yes. Right. We talked about burying it. What we're going to do is we're going to start burying it by giving the search engine other things to look at when it comes to our name. Right. Right. So anything that we did with them, we'll take off the internet because we can control that. Right. So if it's not on the internet anymore, then they can't search for it. You mean, right? you mean like pages on the website where, you know, I've been building with this guy or this gal or mm -hmm. something like that. Is that, that's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Any yeah. links that you have to their website, get them off. Right. Right. You basically disassociate yourself there. Then you create another relationship and you start uh, promoting the heck out of it. Everything you do for about three to six months is about this new relationship and how you love doing it, dot, dot, dot. This is a great time to, to really lean into any community relationships you already have, right. any upcoming events that are there, and just make that the narrative. And you just ignore that that other connection because it'll disappear. Time, time erases all, yeah. right? This too shall pass. Yep. Okay. Okay. So if, if, if I want to take a little more of an intelligent dive into SEO as, as a construction company owner, and I know I don't have the time to do that myself, nor mm -hmm. necessarily the interest or the capacity, what are some next steps that I should be taking to, to get my arms around this and leverage it for the benefit of my business? So there are two ways you can do it. One is to do it yourself. And there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, tools out there. One of them, which we had just mentioned, there's some DIY things like semrush.com, uh, dizio.biz. Uh, there's a, there are different platforms to do it, but most everybody's listening to the show is going to go. No. Yeah. Right. So really you're just talking about finding yourself a reputable search engine marketing firm. Yep. And not just any ad ad agency. Do not go to your TV rep and ask them about SEO because they're going to hire it out to somebody else. It's right. going to be a third party that's made a deal with the conglomerate and it's it's basically systemized. You want somebody who will know take you on in your market alone exclusively. Okay. Now most TV and and those bigger firms that are the kind of the national firms and stuff like that, they won't do that, right? And for like for my firm, we say basically, we, if we're going ag after a group of keywords, we will not go after that group of keywords for anybody else. Okay, so that's important. Tell me, tell me why that's important. What you just said, because they can, you can only have one winner, and you, if you have a firm that's getting paid by two companies, right. The yellow pages used to be really bad at this, and I would call them out on it because they would say, "Hey, you you should just use us." Dot, dot, dot. I'm like, but if I bring one of my clients to you to do this, who are, and you have another client that's already doing it, who are you going to rank number one? Well, whoever pays the most. Right. Okay. Well, that's not how I do business. Right. I said my my people come to me because they want this, and so if I'm exclusive to them, that means I have one master. I will only serve, you can not serve two masters. Right. So if a firm's already utilize, is already uh, working with one of your big competitors, they're not going to be a good servant to you because they've got two masters. Yep. And so I just, we work with companies nationwide so that we can have multiple contractors across the nation and not have any competition. Yep. Yep. Right. Okay. So tell me how we can get in touch with you, Buzz. Tell us just a little bit more about your company. So buzzworthy.biz is our website and we are an integrated marketing firm. So when somebody comes in, so if you called us and said, Hey, we listened to you on the, the, the construction genius. Um, I'm going to say, that's great. We, we can talk about SEO, but we're going to talk about the big picture because we want to make sure SEO actually fits for you. Yeah, that's okay? great. And then we're doing it for the right reasons. And that's what we really do is when, when somebody comes to us, it, we're usually you're bringing, they're coming to us for uh, questions on a tactic. Yep. We are a strategy first firm. That doesn't mean tens of thousands of dollars to figure out who your perfect profitable client is. Yep. It just means that we need to look at your strategy first and find out what tactics are going to work for you in your situation, in your part of the industry, in your location.
Excellent. And very, very specific on that. And how can people get in touch with you? They can go to buzzworthy.biz, or if you want to contact me directly, you can find me on LinkedIn at Michael Bazinski. Yep. And, uh, and my email is buzz at buzzworthy.biz. Cool. All the links are in the show notes. Buzz, thanks for coming back on Construction Genius today. Thanks so much. Right on. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Michael. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Thought it was particularly interesting to talk about reputation management and the humanizing of your brand online and the importance of who you associate with. Think about that a little bit. Who is your brand associated with? Perhaps that's not even in construction and how can you influence that as you go forward and build your reputation? Feel free to connect with Michael through his website or through LinkedIn. The links are in the show notes. Share this episode with other people who you think would benefit from listening to it. <laughs> and then finally, hey, give me a review or, or a rating or both wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Construction Genius.